What I would like to do is start off with uh, the invocation to the sage Patanjali. And I want to see who all is here. Okay. Great. So if you feel ready, you can sit tall. We'll do the invocation to the sage Patanjali um, all together. And many of you here also know the second invocation. Since we're doing um, studies of the yamas and yamas, it can be a good idea, auspicious to do the second invocation. So we'll chant that as well. For those of you who know it, if you need to get out your papers, you can get out your papers. If you don't have your papers, that's okay. It's a wonderful opportunity to listen. Rex Rexes on, no, those are kitty cats. All right. <laughs> Piece of Ruby's got a wonderful shirt of kitty cats there. <laughs> right? <laughs> okay, let's get started then. Bring your hands together in front of your heart. Close your eyes. Turn your attention inwards. Gaze upon the heart. We'll chant the invocation to the sage Patanjali. And then the second invocation to the sage Patanjali. After we chant three ohms, so we'll chant all three times first. Yogena jetasya padena vacham Malam shari rasya chabai jakena Yopa karutam pravaram munina Patanjalim pranjadirana tosmi Abahu purushakaram Shankar chakra Sahasra Shirasam Shvetam Pranamami Patanjanam Hari Yasyatva Rupamadyam Prabhavati Jagato Netadhana Grahaya Prachina Klesha Rashir Vishama Vishatharo Nekavatra Saboki Sarvagnana Prasutir Bujaka Parikaraha Prita Yasya Nityam Devo Hisha Savovyat Sita Vimala Tanur Yoga Do Yoga Yuktaha Om Shanti Shanti Shanti
as you're ready, you can put your hands onto your thighs, lift your face and open your eyes. Thank you all so much for coming today. This is really wonderful. Wow, this is great. So um, just to introduce myself um, more and a little bit about the plan today. Um, you're welcome to uh, drink your chai, make yourself comfortable. Um, I am um, not a natural lecturer, <laughs> but I am a child of a lecturer, a child of a natural born lecturer. So I think that occasionally I'm called to give talks and it doesn't uh, surprise me so much, uh, but it, it doesn't come so naturally to me. Uh, for those of you who know me and, and have worked with me over the years, I'm a, a teacher of asana, but I have a, um, a deep passion and interest in yoga philosophy. And this talk um, we planned for the Sadhana Studies Group, which is our, our intensive immersion, to talk about some of the nuts and bolts of the yamas and niyamas. But it um, really felt clear to me that um, we needed to open this talk up to the public. For the Sadhana Studies Group, um, their homework this month is related to social justice and yoga. Um, and they have an exercise that they're going to be doing on um, personal power and collective power as it relates to the yamas and niyamas. And um, it being Martin Luther King Day and being on the eve of an election, it felt really important to me personally that we open up this program um, to the public. Some of you, um, may know, but for those of you who don't know, before I became a yoga teacher, um, I had a career in nonprofit work and around social justice, particularly um, working with and supporting the upliftment of communities of color. And so my interest in um, social justice and racial justice is lifelong. And <clears throat> My brief academic experience was, all, was focused on the civil rights movement, the women's rights movement and leadership in general. And so my um, interest in Martin Luther King, my interest in uh, leadership also is lifelong. And I've always been, um, I'll talk a little bit more about this later, but I've always been interested in what are the daily habits of leaders that allows them to do what they do? Where, where does the passion come from? Where does the moral backbone come from? What decisions do they need to make in, a daily, in their daily life to do what they do? There are many, many, many leaders in the civil rights movement that have no popular um, exposure, right? There are many people who did things like Martin Luther King did that we don't know about. There are many unsung heroes, but there is something very particular to the way Martin Luther King conducted his life on a daily basis that gave him the power to do tremendous important things that have changed all of our lives for the better. And so I think that this talk feels sort of like an interesting opportunity, a precious opportunity for each one of us to think about our moral and ethical lives and I'll talk about a little bit later, but the Yoga Sutras tell us that if you want to calm the mind, if you want to find any peace within, there are many practices you can do. And one of those practices you can do are focus on sages 
focus on those who have inspired you and to think about what did they do? How would they behave? What would they say? What would they think? And how does that translate in your daily life? And so by the meditation on these sages, that you can actually experience a greater sense of peace within your heart. And so I suppose that that is one way of looking at today's discussion in relationship to Martin Luther King, because he's certainly been um, somebody that I've contemplated a fair amount over the years. I'll leave time at the end for discussion and question and answers, but I wanted to start off as a talk because I think that it's important to get a grounding in the, the uh, Vedic philosophy specifically. So the yamas and the niyamas are here to support your moral and ethical life. They are here to support your relationship with yourself and your relationship with other people that includes on physical levels that includes energetic levels that includes mental and emotional levels and it includes on a soul level it includes what you can see in yourself and other people and what you can't see that which is visible that which is invisible sometimes you can see if someone's practicing the yamas by how they treat other people Sometimes you can see if someone is clean of the body, even clean of the mind by how they organize themselves, how they care for themselves. But in short, to define the yamas, yamas are literally means control. And it's what do you do with yourself in relationship to others? The yamas are the moral backbone of yoga. And the niyamas are what you do with yourself even when no one else is looking. They're both important. They both teach you um, spiritually and morally how to connect with yourself, how to connect with others. And I'll say that it's impossible to really move forward on the path of yoga if you're not attending to basic morality. So these, the yamas and the niyamas are what come first, even before you get to asana practice, before you get to pranayama practice. The yamas and niyamas come first. So this talk is really going to be about the Yoga Sutras themselves and what the Yoga Sutras teach us about the Yamas and the Yamas. But where I can, I would like to tie this a little bit to Martin Luther King, where it feels uh, appropriate. I certainly feel like at this moment in our nation's history, we're at a crossroads. We're so well aware of inequity and inequality, and we don't always feel that we can do something about it. Or maybe we know that we can do something about it, but feel paralyzed to do. Martin Luther King took action. And all of us have tremendous power within inside of ourselves to take action, to get over the paralysis, to sit in a place of quiet and then take action. And Dr. King gave so many talks and sermons about how action should be taken. He wrote a lot. Um, one book that I think has been, is particularly powerful is this one. It's called, uh, I'll, I'll, it's called Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos or Community? Um, if you read this book, it was um, written in 1968. And it's a very powerful and important book to read right now as we're heading into inauguration because you'll see how much hasn't changed since he wrote it in 1968. For the white folks in the room, he has a whole chapter on what the white folks should do, how they can, he has a whole series of directions, so to speak, it's very potent and powerful, but it really is talking about how do we move, um, where do we go from here? <laughs> we go into chaos or we go into community? And he talks quite a bit about ethics. About personal power and about our ability to transcend our most basic impulses. So when you're talking about the yamas and niyamas, you're talking about our most basic impulses for good or for not good. And um, how can we rise to the occasions, no matter how tough 
a certain circumstance may be. Dr. King was known for his kindness and his empathy. Um, in fact, the foreword of this book explains um, how his deep resources of empathy and compassion were richly and naturally part of his life. And so too for the yogis, a compassion and empathy for yourself as well as for those around you. Now, I don't, I'm not a scholar of Dr. King, so I don't know how deeply he studied the Yamas and the Yamas. I don't know much about his connection to Vedic ethics, but I do know that as a sage, um, he can have a profound effect for each one of us today. And as we work more deeply with the Yamas and the Yamas in general. So with that, I think I would like to go into talking about the Yamas and the Yamas, but I don't mind stopping for brief questions or thoughts. If somebody has anything to say, I welcome it. And I know that many of you uh, on this, um, some of you on this uh, line today have studied the Yamas and the Yamas for as long as I have. So um, I certainly will welcome input and I'll try to stop along the way, but I think maybe there might be a question now or a thought now. You can just unmute yourself. I think that might be the best. This is awesome. Um, if Yama means control, is the prefix uh, ni, does that mean something? Is it like outward restraint? Oh yeah, it does mean something, but I didn't even look it up. So I apologize. <laughs> Isn't that funny? <laughs> I was thinking the prefix near means without, but it doesn't include. Oh, I'll get out their book in the back and look it up. I'm sure. <laughs> Heather, um, in the spirit of you know, uh, well, not in the spirit of, but with the concept of um, parampara, wasn't wasn't Dr. King um, very heavily influenced by Gandhi? I mean, absolutely was, he was with the whole movement of nonviolence. Yeah. Right? I mean, Absolutely. he modeled that after Gandhi. So I would think that there's some, maybe not intentional, maybe not as such, but it's a kind of parampara, right? Where he's really taking from that. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry I didn't explain that so deeply. Yeah, absolutely. He studied, he studied Gandhi. Oh, here, Gopika. Thank you, Gopika. He even traveled to meet Gandhi. See, this is a part of the history that I don't know, that I would really like to know. I would like to know how much he studied Vedic. Um, philosophy, how much time, like, I didn't even know that he went to India. So thank you, Gopika. Maybe if you have any resources that I should look up, because I am really uh, personally interested in, in this, because he didn't write extensively about the um, Yamas and Niyamas beyond nonviolence. And that is um, totally appropriate because from a Vedic perspective, you pick up a practice and you go into it deeply. You don't have to um, try and be a jack of all trades because you'll end up being a master of none. So for Gandhi, it was nonviolence that he went into deeper and deeper and deeper and explored it. But uh, I am so curious to know more about his studies. And I know some of you wanna look that up right away um we can you we can look it up after class and and a lot of you i'm in contact with quite often so we can continue this uh exploration together um i have uh yeah he used yes thank you gopika he did use a lot of biblical passages that are the same uh, in fact i'll give you one biblical passage right now before we go on to the yamas and yamas because i thought this wasn't actually he did use a lot of biblical passages but this one this one's a biblical one but it was so um, there's so much in this book that is pretty much uh, taken out of um, Vedic philosophy, not the Yamas and Niyamas specifically. So I didn't prepare those quotes for you. But one that really struck me was he, he writes, in the first century BC, Cicero said, freedom is participation in power. And he goes on to talk about what is freedom and what is power. And um, then later he said, then later another quote, he says, integration comes after liberation. And so, so from a Vedic standpoint, that's really intriguing. Integration comes after liberation. 
because from the Vedic standpoint, it's the opposite. That Samyama comes before Kaivalya. So we're not going to get into that so much today, but it's just interesting to read his, his writing and then investigate, well, what does that mean? What is the context? What is he thinking? It's so interesting. But let me get back to the yamas and the yamas for now. Um, if that sounds good. All right. So, as I mentioned, the yamas and the yamas are the um, first um, stages of practice. They are the first limbs of the practice to be a yoga practitioner. And the yamas are about the control as it relates to social conduct, how you need to conduct yourself in society properly. I'll just read the five out loud and then we'll go quite a bit deeper into each one of them. So the first one is ahimsa, which is nonviolence. The second satya is truthfulness. The third is asteya, non-stealing. The fourth is brahmacharya or continence. And the fifth is aparigraha or non-hoarding. So I'll repeat all this because we're going to go deeply into it. The order matters. Always when you're working with yoga philosophy, the first thing is the most important thing. Ahimsa is non-harming. So you can think of it as the, the power of, of ahimsa is non-harming in action, in thought, and in speech. It starts, though, though all of the yamas are how you work with other people. The non-harming has to start with how you work with yourself. So some examples could be how you talk to yourself, harnessing your own mental powers to speak kindly to yourself, to have a positive outlook, to create structures in your life so that you're able to maintain good boundaries. These are all examples of ahimsa. And I think that you could probably agree that these are some of the hardest things to do. To treat yourself, not just well in terms of what you eat and the things you expose yourself to, but how you speak to yourself in ways that are kind, that, um, that are nourishing. When it comes to harm outside, you have to consider your thoughts, your speech, and your actions. Some of the thornier places where ahimsa can come up is, do you speak up when harm is about to occur? When you see that harm is happening, what do you do? Do you run away? Do you freeze? Do you speak up? Do you cause harm with your words? And I would say all of us do. All of us have experiences where we cause harm with our words. It's not just your actions. It's not just, are you hurting somebody physically, but how might you walk through the world in ways that cause harm with your words? So as I mentioned, Ahimsa is the first on this list, it's the most important and everything else comes from non harming. Sutra 235 says that when you are established in non-violence, when you're established in non-harming, enmity evaporates. People's hostility is abandoned around you. That's one of the nice things about working with the sutras, especially these, is it explains what happens when you're established in it, when you found the power in this particular yama, nonviolence, enmity evaporates and people's hostility, hostility towards anything can be abandoned around you. This doesn't mean that when you're established in nonviolence that pain evaporates. And certainly the life of those who use their powers of nonviolence will undoubtedly experience tremendous pain. You can certainly think of Martin Luther King 
in that way. He was so steeped in nonviolence. He was so committed to it. And yet he experienced tremendous pain and eventually died for his actions, died for his beliefs. There were so many threats. There were so many personal sacrifices. Yet his commitment to nonviolence, his faith in the power of nonviolence was unshakable. It was unshakable. And it allowed him to cope. It allowed him to manage the pain and it allowed him, his faith, his belief in nonviolence gave him a kind of peacefulness that he could think critically and strategically about his own personal growth as a human being and that of the people around him in order to create the world, a world that was more equitable and more just. So some things that you can think about when you're thinking about your own practices of non-harming, when you're thinking about how to work with the power of nonviolence, you can think about what is being neglected, what is being avoided. Are there places that you tend to smother? Are there places that you tend to, or people that you tend to use hard words? This is all included in ahimsa or nonviolence. There's so much, you know, I'm sure that I could do a whole talk on ahimsa. Thank you, Dahlia, for your comment about caste. Uh, I'll show that book. <laughs> I, it's right. Um, yeah, such an important book. Thank you. I didn't even know. So this is Isabel Wilkerson's book on caste. Some of you, I'm sure, have heard about it, have started on it. I haven't started on it, obviously. <laughs> it's coming. Isabel Workerson. It's a new book. All right. So I think maybe uh, because because Ahimsa is so important, I'd like to take a few moments and invite any of you who have been working with Ahimsa specifically, if you would like to speak up and offer any observations about uh, working with it, that might be a good place to start. If you would like to say anything. Um, I can add um, about Ahimsa that um, I studied for about a year and a half a lot of nonviolent communication and um, NBC, and I found that that practice really helped me uh, with techniques for Ahimsa. Um, and it really went hand in hand with my yoga practice. And some of the biggest like takeaways from my studies was that you really need to be present um, and uh, aware of what's going on inside of you. And in order to make the choice of how you want to respond, um, you know, first of all, internally and so, you know, all that kind of empathy and curiosity for another really stems in the ability to be present and focus. And so I think um, the yoga practice really does um, just contribute so much to that effort. Thank you, Imbal. I'm not sure whether the spotlight showed up. Did you guys see Imbal? You didn't, okay. My Zoom was going crazy. It was flashing all sorts of bonkers things. So uh, <laughs> it's nice to be able to see who is speaking. So that was involved for those of you <laughs> uh, who didn't recognize the voice. Let's start to talk uh, about the next one. So <clears throat> satya or truthfulness. You know, I'm speaking so much from a yogi's perspective. I, I'm not a swami, I'm not steeped in in talks like this. So I appreciate you bearing with me. Sometimes just um, hearing these words over and over and over again is such a, a, a tremendous um, oppor opportunity for polishing the mind, polishing 
the chitta in order to bring forth these qualities um, when we find ourselves slipping into old grooves, old habits prior to our, our awareness um, of, of sort of the importance. So let's get into truthfulness. I guess I maybe in being truthful wanted to, to, to just say that, that um, the power of satya, the power of satya is truthfulness and truthfulness includes overcoming delusion and lying. And I think that freedom from lies and deception is obvious. So, so it's obvious that we, we should strive to um, be open, to be transparent, but honestly, being truthful really requires practice. It requires real practice because there are degrees of being truthful. There are outright lies. There are white lies. There are silent lies. And then there's the lies that come when you're not saying what you think. Truthfulness is important for strong relationships and for a dignified community. Truthfulness includes saying things that are accurate and avoiding generalizations. But remember that non-harming comes first. And we know that often the truth really hurts. Often the most important lessons that we learn in our lives come from painful situations. And certainly major reflection is required to wrestle when these two vows or these two powers are in conflict. For example, when you want to give somebody feedback, but you know that that feedback will be painful to hear. You have to really think about what do you want to say and how do you want to approach the situation so that you can cause the least amount of harm possible, but also speak the truth even when it's hard to say, it's painful to say, and it's painful to be received. Being truthful requires real practice. It's absolutely an art to be truthful. We should be free from lies, we should be free from deception, but if you really want to commit yourself to satya, it requires a daily practice of looking at the white lies, looking at the silent lies, looking at what needs to be said, but you're not saying it. And also accepting that there are times when you would like to say something, but you don't say it because it would be too harmful. Sutra 236 says that the power in satya is that your words become so potent, whatever you say comes to realization. This is a, this sutra, Sutra 236, is something that I really take to heart. You don't know the full power of your words. You don't know how your words are going to affect somebody else. It may affect them in that moment. It may affect them over the day. It may affect them over months and years. I'm sure that each one of you has had an experience where somebody said something to you and it stayed with you. And certainly Martin Luther King is a really great example of that. The things that he said have stayed with us. They certainly have stayed with me for decades. So certainly his words were potent, though not everything he said came to realization. There was much that he said that did come to realization. And if you take it to heart that what you say comes to realization, then it's a little bit easier to look at your words. Do you understand what I'm saying? Like, if you know that if you tell a lie, it may come to realization. <laughs> If you know that the power of your words <clears throat> will have ramifications many, many years down the line, it may be remembered by the person or people you said it to, then you think a little more carefully before you say it, which isn't so easy, especially for those of you who are like me, quite loquacious, quite wordy, <laughs> not so easy. 
but this is the power of truthfulness is satya. The next is asteya, refraining from stealing. The power of asteya is non-stealing. There's a lot of different ways to think about non-stealing. It can start with very basic things like music and copyrights, giving um, recognition to the originators of the material. That might be in quotes, that might be in music, but that's also in ideas. So Parampara was mentioned earlier. It's one reason why in the Iyengar Yoga method, especially we talk about who our teachers are. Where did this information come from? That is an act of asteya to refrain from stealing, to take an idea that you got from somebody else as your own is immoral. And taking what does not belong to you, saying that it is yours is not okay. So one way to think about asteya is, are you a taker? And if you're a person who's taking often, what ways are you taking that give homage, that give blessings to, that give appreciation and recognition? And particularly when it comes to social justice, especially for white folks, this is this is really has to be looked at, really can be unpacked in powerful, beneficial ways. One virtue that you can cultivate to bolster your powers of non-stealing is to offer gifts, to be in a state of offering blessings instead of a taking place. And I certainly know people like that who are, are spending their days being of service. Sometimes the way that I've seen people be of service to be, um, working with this is um, I have a friend who just sends appreciations on a very regular basis, often when you least expect it. Lately, she's been sending appreciations to the Adeline yoga team. And it's just every time she sends it, it strikes me. She'll say, you know, I know you all are working so hard. I appreciate you for this. And she doesn't just send it to me, she sends it to whoever might be doing something for her. And it always just strikes me that um, being appreciated is, is such a, a count, it's such a wonderful counterbalance. Uh, instead of being a taker, you're being a sharer, a sharer of light, a sharer of blessings, a, a sharer of illumination a sharer of energy, of resources. And so in that way, it's an opportunity to counteract the sort of stealing nature or taking nature that all of us have as a basic human instinct. So that's a stay up. Brahmacharya. Brahmacharya is use of sexual energy. Um, the way I like to think about brahmacharya is continence the proper use of sexual energy. Certainly there's traditions, um, modern and ancient, that would say the body is dirty. But in Hatha Yoga, it's said that the body contains energy and the body contains energy that needs to be directed, it needs to be controlled, it needs to be watched, it needs to be used ethically. So when you're talking about brahmacharya, what you're talking about is boundaries that it's very important to have good boundaries. It's important to be aware of the multiple relationships that we have each other with each other and to be really clear, to be really clear to create containers of support that have boundaries. There is a time and a place for everything. Knowing what is the time, knowing what is the place is, is incredibly important. And I certainly find that for myself. That's one reason why I like being around yogis because we do really cultivate boundaries so that you know where you're at with somebody, you know where the lines are drawn and that can create an important container of support. 
Now, <laughs> if you want to cultivate brahmacharya, there are other yamas that will support you. Certainly asteya, non-stealing, and ahimsa, non-harming, as well as satya, the truthfulness, will really help you cultivate brahmacharya. Sutra 238 says that when you cultivate brahmacharya, when you're well-established in continence, that knowledge, vigor, valor, energy will follow. That's Guruji's translation of Sutra 238. Now the last is a parigraha. A parigraha is the power to be free from hoarding, to be free from a thirst for acquisition. It includes freedom from greed and from coveting. So there's no doubt that there are connections between a parigraha and asteya. There are connections between the idea of um, stealing and not and non-stealing and non-coveting because they both involve greed. But a parigraha is about not keeping too much, whereas asteya is about not taking what is not yours, right? So asteya is about not stealing what other people have. And a parigraha is, not, is about not hoarding what you have. Sutra 239 says that when you're free from coveting, knowledge of the past and future unfolds and you start to understand the nature and purpose of existence. And to me, this makes a lot of sense. When you stop being greedy over your possessions, whether they're possessions related to the physical things that you have, whether it's related to your material wealth, whether it's related to your degrees, you know, your education, when you stop holding on to, in a prideful way, the things that you have, things unfold much more easily and you have much clearer knowledge of where you've been and where you're going. Because there's a sense of ease when you're not grasping or hoarding, having a thirst for acquisition. It just makes more clarity in your life. And as Aiden says, absolutely, when you're not hoarding your time, which is different than um, creating boundaries. Because there's a fine line between hoarding something and creating boundaries, wouldn't you say? Boundaries are important, but when you cross the line into someone else's boundaries, that's not good. And when you so strictly stay within your boundaries, this is mine, this is mine, this is mine, that's also not good. So all of these are fine lines. Now, before we go on, I'd like to call your attention to a few of the other sutras that relate to both the yamas and the yamas. First of all, Sutra 231 says that the, the um, Yamas are universal, the, that they, I'll, I'll read to you exactly. The yamas are considered to be a great vow. They are not exempted by one's class, place, time, or circumstance. They are universal. And um, that's really important because it, it's every single one of us has an opportunity to take this vow. And we also have an opportunity to support everyone else in our community, in our nation, in our world, in their ability to uphold these vows. And so, and that's where social justice, a belief in equity, a belief in equality comes into place because you do have a responsibility to the others in this world, in this life, so that they may also be in a place where they can work with the Yamas. So this is very interesting. No matter time and place, we all have to uphold these behaviors. Even in the face of brutality, nonviolence must be practiced. Maybe you need to be clever. Maybe you need to be strategic in order to get your point across as Dr. King did without spilling blood. He needed to be very strategic. He needed to be very clever about how to create social change and still be committed to nonviolence, but he did it. And so all, each one of us, I think, when we're in very difficult positions can be inspired to find clever and strategic ways to practice the, the yamas 
and still um, get our point, our, our point across, to get our beliefs across. Now, moving on to the niyamas, which are about what you do with yourself when no one else is looking. We'll start with Saucha. Saucha is the power of cleanliness or purity. And what's interesting about Saucha is there's actually two sutras, 240 and 241, that go into cleanliness and purity. And it starts, of course, cleanliness and purity starts with your own powers of physical purification. So that's really straightforward. Keep your clothes clean, keep your body clean, but purification has to go much deeper into the parts of your mind, into your emotions. Certainly teachers in my life, um, get to best card being one, have reminded us, her students, that the internal landscape has to be weeded like a garden constantly. That when you see things growing up that shouldn't be there, you have to pluck them out. That you're certainly creating a mind and a body fit for a sp uh, spiritual journey. And the garden always needs to be weeded. You're constantly um, looking at your own behavior, starting with Saucha. And I not potentially spends two sutras on this topic, you know, so that means that it's very important. He says that when the body is clean, the mind is freed from the film of confusion or delusion, that the senses are brought under control. And when, when the mind is freed from the film of confusion, from the film of delusion, the senses are brought under control and joyful awareness comes. The kind of awareness that you need to realize your inner self. Meaning that when you practice Shaucha, you can see things more clearly. You can see the world around you and the world inside of you more clearly. With Shaucha, we are absolutely, so to practice Shaucha means you're absolutely gonna be stripping away activities that you don't need. Foods that don't serve you and relationships which bring you to unhealthy places. Okay, of that, there is no doubt. It's not easy and it's why many people don't ever endeavor upon this path because the work is too hard. I think that we need to stop for a moment, just for a moment to discuss Shaucha because it is the first of the Niyamas and from that, everything else comes. Does anybody who has been working with Shaucha want to uh, talk about their experience, something that has been helpful or something to consider when you're thinking about Shaucha? Um, whenever I think about Shaucha, I kind of feel the need to, I don't know, have like a balance and a moderation as well. Um, because I feel like a lot of times in, you know, spiritual communities, the purification can cause harm. Like, um, you know, being too strict about something or, um, I don't know. So I just feel like there's this, there's this fine line that we really need to be aware of. Yeah, I think that's really true. You know, Guruji, for those of you who have spent any time in Pona, it can be amazing as you were, as you would be walking by the house, just how much time he spent watching um, cricket. He would sit in front of the tech TV and watch a fair amount of cricket. And he was, he was really interested in um, that. And the, the family watches, uh, definitely, you know, sits around and watches TV. And that isn't necessarily considered a spiritual endeavor. Uh, I find for myself, those of you who spend time around me, I watch um, a fair amount of TV. It actually surprises me sometimes how much TV I watch. And I think that it is in part because um, that's my karma. 
<laughs> I know others that would like to induce them many more hours in meditation, but sometimes for me, the mind just needs to go to another place, right? The mind needs to, to travel and especially sheltering in place. I find even more that if I'm not traveling um, physically, that I need to travel in my mind to somebody else's world that is not my own. And in that way, there's a, it satisfies for me some innate curiosities that I have about the world around me that isn't directly related to yoga. And it's the same thing with the food that we eat. If we're, if we're obsessive about the cleanliness of the food that we eat, that is hoarding. If we're obsessive about every single material that we put on our body, that is also hoarding. So there is definitely a close relationship for sure between um, being, um, Remember between Shao Cha, yeah, and a Parigraha. There is. Thank you, Imbal. Let's move on to Santosha. So, Santosha is the power of contentment, having an, a balanced and easy state of mind under all circumstances, having an evenness of mind, having equilibrium, even when you're super challenged. And so, you can see that the relationship of Santosha to some of the yamas is very, very clear, especially one around nonviolence. Santosha is supported also by asteya and aparigraha, non-hoarding and non-stealing. You can find contentment when you're not hankering for more than what is at hand. Patanjali says in Sutra 242 that the power of Santosha from that contentment comes supreme unexcelled joy because it's, it's a pure joy that is not dependent on material things, that is not dependent on sensory desires. So Santosha, I don't know that you can cultivate Santosha. I think that the practice of the yamas and the yamas creates a fertile field for santosha to sprout. Santosha sprouts along with, the, uh, with weeds. And when you pluck out the behaviors, the thoughts that are unhealthful and unhelpful, you give more room for santosha to bloom. And santosha um, can come in in sort of unexpected ways where you just, you have this experience of unexcelled supreme joy. And then there's other times when you just, Santosha often comes when things roll off your back, when something that might have bothered you before doesn't bother you anymore. That is also Santosha, where you're no longer getting caught up in other people's business or something that might have made you anxious or angry before just doesn't bother you anymore. That's also uh, a quality of Santosha. Tapas is next. Tapas is the power of determined effort, the power of self-discipline. Tapas also means austerity, the willingness to say no to things in order to say yes to what you really want. So tapas absolutely requires discernment because there is inherent in it a kind of austerity, a willingness to say no to things that might come your way. So it'll give you more room to say yes to what's most important. Tapas, another way of thinking about tapas is, its power is, um, the, is determined effort in your sadhana. It means that you make intentional choices, that your actions follow through with your intentions. You know, we all have intentions, but how often are we following through with our intentions? How, what do we need to do to keep ourselves from getting distracted or losing our way? Tapas is here and it's Sutra 243 says that self-discipline, tapas, burns away impurities and Guruji says that it kindles the sparks of divinity, giving you a kind of clarity in your senses. And by senses, we're talking about the eyes, the ears, the nose, the mouth, 
the skin, like what, what, where are you being drawn outward? And what can you do with tapas to bring you back inward? And Guruji says that when you really are constantly bringing yourself back inward, using self-discipline, that you start to kindle the sparks of divinity, giving yourself a relationship with a collective good and the collective mm, universal spirit. And we'll talk about that in a moment. The next is svadhyaya or the power of self-study. And there's two components to this, study of the scriptures and self-reflection. Self-reflection, looking at your own thoughts, your own actions is so important because only then can the hidden impurities, only then can the uh, darkness or um, poor choices be eradicated in that sense. And the study of the scriptures fills your buddhi. So the study of the ancient text or, or even contemporary texts like some of the books that we've talked about, it really fills not your intellectual intelligence, but it fills buddhi. Buddhi is your higher wisdom, which includes a, the, a, a sharp higher wisdom that is based on experience, that we could talk a little bit more about intelligence and where delusions can come in so easily. But, but I'm talking about booty, where um, the part of you that your higher self, that which is filled with lightness, goodness, benevolence, empathy, compassion, and clarity. The study of scriptures, just sitting and reading the yoga sutras, one yoga sutra before you go to bed at night, it fills your mind, it fills your heart, it inspires you even while you sleep. So the next day you feel more empowered, more powerful to conquer whatever trials and tribulations come. Even those trials and tribulations sometimes are direct, but other times it's it's um, sorting through the something that has happened and deciding what do you want to do about it? What would be the highest and best use of your time, highest and best use of your actions, your word? The study of the scriptures can really help uh, illuminate buddhi. But first you have to pay attention. That's what svadhyaya is, it's paying attention and then reflecting. Svadhyaya includes taking time to learn from others, taking time to reflect on your own behavior, and this is where meditation and prayer come in, taking time to settle, settle into the silence. Certainly, this is another place where Martin Luther King comes to mind for me because he was a man who reflected deeply. He was not a reactionary in that he watched himself closely. He reflected on his experience and he reflected on those around him. He was so incredibly thoughtful, studying the scriptures literally, taking them into his heart, into his mind, studying the people around him, their experiences, and translating that into action. Sutra 244 says that through Svadhyaya, the yogi establishes contact with the chosen deity, meaning through self-study, you have a pathway to your own personal relationship to the divine. Now, the last one here is Ishvara Pranidhana. Ishvara Pranidhana is the power to create the ability to surrender to a higher power. So Ishvara Pranidhana includes devotional practices that give you an ability to surrender to a higher power, a universal power, whether that's a specific deity, a specific version of God, whether it's to your heart, whether it's to nature, it's the ability to surrender to something that is higher than yourself. Sutra 245 says that by surrender to the divine source, you can find samadhi. That by surrender to the divine source, you can find freedom, peace, quiet, and a union with the divine. Certainly, the yamas and the yamas are a path to vairagya. And for those of you in the studies program, we'll be talking about vairagya in the coming months. 
there is a certain kind of non-attachment being without cravings being it's not all saying goodbye it's a lot of saying hello saying hello to beauty saying hello to positive nourishing foods saying hello to positive nourishing relationships and practices so in many ways to practice the yamas and the yamas is is stepping into the light it's stepping into goodness it's stepping towards a place where you're be, be, you're becoming more immersed not all of us are practicing the yamas and the yamas all the time I do my best, I use my willpower, I use my insight, I make a lot of mistakes. I'm still working with the yamas and the yamas, constantly learning new things. In the Indian tradition, certain people are born into it and we know sages like Amma, we know sages, even someone like Gandhi, like born into a practice of this that comes um, so close. But for others of us, we have to work towards it. And it may be that each, a certain day of the week, you pick up a particular yama or niyama to work with. It may be um, that there are certain festivals that you attend that might honor deities that um, relate to a certain yama or niyama. It may be that you set intentions to work with a certain yama and niyama. Another way that you could work with these yamas and niyamas is you can put each one in a bowl and put that in on your altar or wherever you sit for your quiet contemplation and each day or just once a week, you pick it out of the bowl and you read it and you spend that day thinking about it as you go about your day, you come back to it. So there are many different ways that you can incorporate the practice of the yamas and niyamas. It can be overwhelming to pick up all 10, but if you work with one at a time and really go deep into it, that's great. Or you might find, oh, there's one that you want to spend the rest of your life exploring. And that also can be done. Certainly you're going to be developing a spiritual muscle. And so you'll start to see where are the places where you're triggered. Like, are you able to practice a parigraha with everybody except that one person who has those certain things that you really, um, who's like always asking you for something? For example, you know, are there certain times of day that you lose your temper and you say nasty things like when I get tired, you know, I might behave very differently than at noon when I'm wide awake. Are there certain places that you find triggering, hard to practice certain yamas and niyamas? Are there certain circumstances where you find it difficult. These are the questions that you can ask yourself if you want to practice the yamas and yamas. You can take one or you can take several on. And then you have to look at where are the triggers? Is it with certain people? Is it the time of day, certain places, certain circumstances? This can be a way to study. The yamas and niyamas are techniques to develop mental strength and ethical character so that you can conquer temptations and obstacles when they're presented to you. Really, the practice of yamas and niyamas, it's easy when you're in pleasant circumstances. It's hard when you're really being tested. And they still, remember that they're universal, they still have to be practiced no matter where you are or what you're doing. So you have to think about those moments when your body says one thing, but your mind says another. Or when your mind says one thing, but your soul says another. Thinking of those times when you're telling yourself one thing and oh, later you realize, oh, this was just an obsession or this was just a misunderstanding. So the yamas and the niyamas are slowly by slowly, surely by surely helping you to develop discriminative wisdom. They also raise your consciousness and they protect you from harm. They protect others from harm to practice the yamas and niyamas. So that's how we end. We end where we started, which was not harming, protecting yourself from harm, developing mental strength and an ethical character. And I think that's where I'd like to end. Um, I guess we're over time. Um, I don't mind sitting for a few minutes and asking, having anybody who wants to ask any questions or offering things up. But I will say for those of you who did join, thank you. Thank you so much for coming. As you can tell, I'm a bit nervous giving a talk like this. Um, 
but I, I do uh, enjoy it, even though it doesn't come naturally. So I, I thank you for, um, for your participation. I would be happy to talk some more. Thank you for coming so much. <laughs> thank you. And, you know, we can end here. Or if you have some thoughts, I'd be happy to, to listen.